yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Scrum Seminar. Uh, today, we have uh, two talks and two speakers. So the first speaker is Bruno Lorio, who, who is currently a research scientist at the uh, Information Learning Physics Laboratory from EPFL, Swiss Federal Institute of the Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland. His research is about working on the crossroads between machine learning and statistic physics. Before joining EPFL, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Paris. And before then, he received his PhD from the University of Cambridge. So without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker. Bruno, you may, you may start to share your screen. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me try to uh, share the screen. Um, I assume you can see my slides? Yeah. OK, that's great. So thank you very much, Zongren, uh, George, and uh, Sondata for this invitation here, for extending this invitation to me here. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, giving this talk to you. So um, without further ado, let's uh, dig into it. This is about a, a, a recent research paper that we have uh, put on archive a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we have submitted for, um, for HTML. So it's still under revision. So if you have any feedback, I'm happy to discuss. Um, feel free to ask any questions to interrupt me. Um, I think I don't have too many slides, so um, like any discussion is very welcome. Uh, okay, so this is work uh, done in collaboration uh, with a bunch of uh, very uh, good people here from the lab. So there is uh, Rodrigo Vega, who's, who was a visiting PhD student uh, here uh, at EPFL. He's now at USP in Brazil. Um, Ludovic Stefan, who is a postdoc in our group, uh, Lenkas de Borova, and Florent Jacalac, who you probably uh, know better. So uh, I must say before, like just a disclaimer, is that uh, here in our group, we are a collaboration between physicists and mathematicians. And uh, we do, um, we, we combine some techniques from these different fields. And uh, so in this work particularly, like me and Rodrigo, we are the physicists that, uh, that took this work uh, forward, and Ludovic is the mathematician. So, uh, if there is any hard mathematics questions that you have about the, the rigorous part of the work, uh, I'm sorry in advance, I'll have to send you to, uh, to Ludovic, but I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your emails about all the epsilons uh, about the work that I'm going to be speaking today. Okay, so since I'm in Switzerland, I can't, uh, I can't stop myself to start with a uh, hiking analogy. So uh, here we like to hike a lot. And um, when you are on the top of the mountain and uh, it starts to get dark, um, I think it happened with most of people that, uh, that uh, tend to hike that one day you forget about the time and you need to go down. And then you, if you don't know how to go down, if you don't have a map of the landscape, uh, you start to try to follow the, like the steepest descent uh, direction. Uh, but this can be very dangerous because uh, you can might end up in a local valley that uh, surrounded by mountains and uh, not in the town where you have to take your train. So uh, that can be very dangerous. So Usually you need to take your map with you. And that's exactly how the decent algorithms that we use nowadays to train uh, machine learning work, model uh, uh, some, uh, some complications. And despite the fact that we know that uh, most of the landscapes that we're trying to optimize just look like uh, these hiking landscapes where we have uh, plenty of uh, local minima, global minima valleys that are connected, uh, still they seem to be finding some minima which have pretty good uh, generalization. And uh, trying to understand this question is one of the most important uh, open questions uh, in machine learning. And uh, in particular, this interaction between the landscape and the algorithm is a very important question. Now, one hypothesis you could make is that, okay, in deep learning, maybe all minima are good global minima. Say, okay, any direction that I get and I get to a minima, I'm gonna go to a good one. However, we know from some experiments, uh, numeric experiments, that we can construct certain initializations for algorithms like stochastic gradient descents on state-of-the-art networks that find badly generalizing uh, minima. And uh, this, is a, this is a very interesting uh, idea. Uh, however, we know that typically, if you initialize your algorithm uh, randomly like we do, we don't tend to fall into this minima. So uh, this work where they construct uh, paths that, uh, that converge to this uh, badly generalized minima is very finely tuned. So you need really to construct this bad, uh, this bad generalized minima to how to achieve them, because typically you don't fall there. Now, there are many reasons, uh, uh, many hypotheses of, uh, of why we don't fall in these minima related to all sorts of things. So for example, there is one hypothesis that says that uh, in very overparameterized neural networks, uh, 
the, the good minima they are usually flat regions with a lot of entropy. So if you start randomly, you probably uh, gonna fall into a large entropy region. Like that's uh, what people call uh, wide, uh, wide minima or um, wide, uh, wide saddles. So uh, we know that's, that that cannot account for the full picture of, uh, of uh, why generalization happens. There are other hypotheses. So for example, uh, a big line of work is trying to, uh, to find why the algorithm itself might be biased towards good generalizing minima. Not only a property of the landscape, but maybe the algorithms that we use like stochastic gradient descent, they have some sort of implicit regularization that uh, leads uh, the stochastic gradient descent to false uh, into this uh, good generalizing minima. Also, we know uh, from uh, also other numerical experiments that that cannot account for the full picture. So there are many, many hypotheses and many, many explanations. Probably the, the answer is a combination of all these things, but that's a still open question and open to a lot of debates. And depending on uh, uh, what's your school, uh, you might defend one or the other uh, explanation. Bruno, now, can I ask uh, a naive question? Yeah. Why, do, why do we care about bad global minima? To avoid them or to go there? Well, we would like to avoid them, right? I mean, we know that uh, we know that the algorithms that we use typically avoid them naturally, and we don't know why. Um, but we'd like to understand why, because if we happen to uh, to find one architecture, for example, where falls uh, uh, into this bad minimum, we'd like to know how to initialize our algorithm, for example, to not fall there, right? I don't know if this. Uh, I see. Uh, no, I was I got confused with this uh, uh, Greek paper. Uh, the, uh, that they, they said the SGD can reach them. So, so yes. I guess it's, it's a possible, it's a possible uh, target. Yeah. yeah, okay. It is a possible target because what, the, so the story is that we know that uh, uh, if you have random labels, there is this very influential paper in 2018 that shows that if you have random labels, uh, it's still your neural network can interpolate these labels. And um, this means that uh, even if there is no information that, right, like there's no generalization, it's just random, you can it's still, uh, uh, interpolate perfectly if you are uh, if you have enough complexity in your function class, and then, however, uh, uh, we also know that if we run these uh, these algorithms uh, on a problem in which there is generalization, so not random labels, uh, we can also find good generalizing minima. And the idea of this uh, this uh, this paper uh, from this group that I showed before is that they managed to build initialization that falls into this bad minima of the random labels problem. Uh, using this idea, so they build labels that uh, that uh, that uh, interpolate from the from the random one. They find this minima and they initialize close to it, and they show that even if the labels are not random, this minima, minima still exists in the landscape. So you can reach them. So uh, they exist; they are there. Uh, the algorithms, as far as we know, typically don't tend to achieve them. And uh, understanding this is a is a is a I, I believe a very important question because if we understand this, we can also bias our algorithms towards the good ones. And in particular, uh, um, there is this line of work on the entropic uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent that exactly use ideas like that. They say, ah, okay, so if good generalizing minima have large entropy, say there are large regions in the landscape, let's add a, explicitly a term in our stochastic gradient descent that gonna favorize like these regions. And then they, you can show that maybe general is better or not. Like there's a lot of discussion about that in the literature. Um, I'm not gonna take any side, just mentioning uh, why it's an interesting problem and why uh, it's important to understand it. So uh, from the physicist perspective, um, we like toy models. So what we would like to do is like to find models where actually we can say something about this because all these works that I showed, most of them are, uh, are concerns like numerical experiments. So we'd like to find models where we can actually explore these questions and to study them. And the simplest non-convex uh, problem that you can study uh, is uh, the two-layer neural network. So in particular, uh, we have like an input layer of, I'm gonna use uh, here always dimension D for the inputs. Uh, we have a hidden layer and uh, I'm gonna use dimension P for, uh, for the size of the hidden layer. And then my predictor here, for the simplicity, I'm gonna be considering a regression problem. So my labels are real valued. And uh, my, my two-layer neural networks uh, basically uh, uh, have a non-linearity sigma and produce a prediction f hat of theta, where theta is the ensemble of parameters, both a and w, the weights. So um, there has been a lot of advances. Excuse me, uh, hello? Yeah? Uh, this is Lulu from your pen. So in your equation cases, it seems to me there's no bias. 
Yes, here there's no bias. You, you can you can introduce a bias if you want. For simplicity, okay. I'm not I'm not going to consider a bias, but all the discussion uh, that I'm going to present here generalizes uh, to a bias. But you're right. You can you can either put the bias on the weights or explicitly write your bias. Uh, here here I'm not going to be considering a bias, but but you're totally right. Okay. And okay, it's important to have a bias for certain architectures because uh, uh, the bias plays an important role uh, depending on the architecture that you choose. Yes, otherwise so, F0 is always zero. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so there has been a lot of advance in the direction of studying two layer neural networks. And in particular, a recent development which uh, um, has, uh, has attracted a lot of uh, uh, attention was the so-called mean field limit. So the mean field limit exactly studies two layer neural networks in the limit where the hidden layer, so this, the P in my previous slide, goes to infinity. And here, I'm just going to give you a taster of these kind of results. I, I, I'm sure some of you are familiar, uh, but for those of, who, of you who are not, uh, I'm just going to give a taster. It's not my work, but I think it's good to know just to compare with, uh, with uh, what I'm going to be speaking later. So this idea of uh, taking the hidden layer uh, to infinity um, appeared more or less at the same time in different groups, uh, uh, like uh, uh, independently. So. Uh, like Lenaik Shiza and Francis Bay in France, um, Grant and uh, Eric van der Neiden uh, uh, in New York, um, Siriano and Spilopoulos, uh, uh, I guess in Boston and uh, Urbana, and uh, Song Mei and Montanari um, and Guin in Stanford. So uh, like separate works like that uh, target the same idea. So what is this idea? So for simplicity, they consider one pass as GD. So that's stochastic gradient descent on the two layer neural network, where at every step, you draw a fresh sample from uh, the distribution of the data. And then you compute the gradient descent with this sample. And then since you are just doing a one, one uh, mini batch size, actually you are just uh, uh, fitting uh, the population uh, risk directly. And the idea is that if I want to take the size of the hidden layer to infinity, I can define a density of weights. So instead of tracking all the weights, I'm going to define this density, this empirical density of weights. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know if you see my my cursor. Uh, I don't think so. Maybe here. Yeah, we can see. Can you see my. We can see it. Okay. So um, so you consider like the the an empirical density of your weights, and you say that. Uh, when the size of the hidden layer goes to infinity, you can show that actually SGD, one pass SGD, converges if the step size is, is small enough with respect to the input dimension to a set of uh, partial differential equations on the density of weights. So you exchange your problem, which is to track P times D uh, uh, weights to actually just tracking densities over RD, where D is the input dimension. And then uh, from this characterization of the, the PDE, you can use all the framework that people have used to study PDEs uh, uh, in the literature, and specifically the literature of Coulomb gases, to prove that actually you have global convergence if you initialize your, uh, your density uh, uh, well enough, you can prove that you converge towards the global minima of the uh, population risk. So that's, a, that's an informal uh, statement of the theorem. I took from this paper, uh, review paper that, that is very good, uh, that explains a bit this line of research, sums up these last three years from Shiza and Ba, that says if the support of the initial distribution includes all directions in RD, and if the function satisfies some uh, regularity properties, then uh, from this PDE, you can prove global convergence. However, this PDE uh, doesn't allow you to track the error at every step. So you can prove the global convergence, but it doesn't give you a way of studying uh, finer scale properties of your PD. So uh, that's, a, that's a very important result from the past years from, uh, for uh, two-layer neural networks. Now, we know that when the hidden layer is not infinity, however, not always you can reach the global minima of the population risk. And actually, there is a whole line of work that dates back from the work of uh, physicists in the 90s that is studying exactly this opposite regime. So this seminal work by, uh, by uh, David Saad and Sara Sola, it works exactly in the narrow regime, while uh, this uh, PDE result is in the wide regime. 
And in particular, uh, what what did they what did they show? First, they work into into a different setting where they assume some properties of a distribution of the data, and that's what we call uh, in the physics community the teacher-student setting. But um, I mean, sometimes in the in the machine learning community, you call like an oracle or a generative model for your data. So you're going to assume some properties of your data, and because you're assuming some properties, you can prove. Uh, more refined results over the trajectory of your uh, of your uh, stochastic gradient descent. However, it has the drawback that if your data is too simplistic, maybe you don't capture uh, uh, too much of the picture. So you are making stronger assumptions to, to be able to do more maths, but uh, uh, they might be too specific, the result. So here, what they assume in the classical work of uh, Sutton and Sula from the 90s is that my Gaussian, my covariates, my input, uh, my input covariates are Gaussian random variable. And uh, the data, the labels, are generated by a neural network itself, which I'm going to call the teacher network, up to a additive Gaussian noise of variance delta. So my data set, my pairs of x and y, are going to come from this process of the teacher network. You draw some x, you generate some, uh, some labels from this network, from this two-layer neural network, and then this data set is given to the statistician who will try to fit it. In particular, note that I, I'll consider a teacher network, which is also a two-layer neural network with a, a hidden dimension K. And I'm gonna uh, uh, assume, I'm gonna specify what K is uh, uh, next. So once you generate the data, this data is given to the student and the student here for the purpose of, of this work is gonna be also a two-layer neural network. And uh, uh, given the data, the student try to learn uh, the, the teacher network. So that's the setting that uh, that uh, Sad and Sola considered uh, back in the 90s. Note that not necessarily the two networks have the same dimension. Um, and uh, here, just for simplicity, I'm going to be fixing the second layer weights uh, to be constant. So just one over p for the for the student and one over k for the teacher. So this also can be generalized. You can also uh, approve all the results that I'm gonna speak about if you, uh, you learn this layer, but it's not gonna be very important for the discussion that follows. So for simplicity, I'm gonna consider the case where we just train the middle layer. And then once we have that, our goal um, is to track uh, the generalization error. Now, if you look at the generalization error, now that you have a model for your labels, the generalization error it's just going to be the difference between the labels minus the predictions. And in particular, everything depends on this scalar product between the weights with the features. So instead of taking this high dimensional average in, uh, in, uh, in D dimensions, if I knew the statistics of these preactivations, I could exchange this average for an average over the statistics of the preactivations where this is the second moment of these fields. So if the data is Gaussian, then these fields are gonna be Gaussian. And in particular, they're gonna have some covariance and some mean, the mean is zero, and the covariance is gonna be given by a matrix, which is K by K plus P times K plus P. So for tracking the error, I just need to track the statistics of the preactivation. And note that the statistics of the preactivation are low dimensional quantities. They are, this is a vector in RK and this is a vector in RP. While the weights were K by D and, uh, and uh, P by D. And so the key idea is that if I manage to take my stochastic gradient descent and map to a set of stochastic differential equations for these sufficient statistics, then I don't need to track the weights to track the error. I just need to solve these low dimensional equations to actually have access to the error. So that's the key idea of the work of Sutton and Sola uh, from the 90s. And what uh, they showed using uh, uh, heuristic methods is that actually you can show that if you scale everything, so if P, K, and the learning rate uh, um, gamma are order one, and you scale the step size by one over D, then this stochastic process on the second moment converts to a set of ODs. And, uh, and uh, this was later like, so this was, uh, was uh, done using just uh, heuristic methods, but was later proved in 2019 uh, 
uh, by Gold and all uh, in a paper that used ideas from uh, stochastic processes to prove the convergence of this uh, um, of this stochastic process towards a deterministic limit given by these ODs. So, if you now get these ODs and you just uh, run them, you can describe perfectly the learning curve for the learning process. And how does it look like? So, if you uh, just uh, plot these ODEs, you solve them numerically and you plot, that's what you find. So you're typically gonna find uh, uh, two plateaus. And the first plateau is what we call an unspecialized plateau. It's a plateau where actually uh, all your neurons from the student are trying to fit the labels of the teacher independently. So it's just behaving like a linear function. Now notice that this is not the same as the lazy regime because the weights are changing a lot. However, the performance is equivalent to the performance of just a linear predictor. So they didn't have enough data yet to discover that there is some nonlinearity and they need to collaborate to actually fit uh, the teacher. So here, notice that I'm considering a setting where um, the number of uh, teacher neurons, it's lower than the number of student neurons. And in particular, the way I normalize things, this is perfectly realizable. So it's, you, you, may, you, you could learn perfectly the teacher um, if, uh, if uh, you train uh, well enough. So uh, how, that's how, the first uh, plateau. Uh, yeah? This is Lulu again. So D is the input dimension, right? Yes, exactly. Then it's fixed for a specific problem. How can we send a D to infinity? D is the problem property, it's fixed. Uh, Sorry, D is what? D is the input dimension, right? Is the, yeah. Let's say if we try to do the regression or image classification, it's fixed. So how can I yeah. change D to infinity? So you could consider, I mean, uh, if you have an image, it has a fixed D, I agree with you, but you could consider some data which is very high dimensional. And what, you, what, what this theorem says basically is that uh, you bound the norm between the deterministic version of those stochastic process by something that scales like one over square root of uh, D. So if D is large enough, means that uh, your updates of the weight behave as if it was some deterministic set of, uh, of ODs. So you, you, you can consider like the finite size uh, uh, corrections to that, but they, they decay as one over square root of D. So okay. I'm gonna show, so in this, in this, uh, in this uh, plot here, uh, I, I forgot to say the lines are solutions of the ODE, while the points are exactly uh, finite size simulations. So you simulate, you actually draw a finite D and you see here different size of D. And uh, you see that as D increases, you get better and better agreement because there is this one over square root of uh, uh, D convergence towards the deterministic limit. And you can see here the fluctuation on the, here I took a random initialization. So you can see here that the fluctuation on the initialization is also of order one over square root of D because it's a Gaussian vector here. Bruno, I have a question. Uh, yes. So we, have, we see this transition here from the unspecialized to specialized plateau. And mm -hmm. the question I have is, is this the same phase transition that people in the uh, information bottleneck theory are talking about or not? Because that's, that's I don't know. I, I don't, don't think know. we that's have a good many, question. Many, uh, we cannot have too many phase transitions. I think it's exactly the same thing. It actually happens around that time. You, you train for a while and then you have this phase transition. And uh, so this, this transition is a transition that uh, uh, occurs when uh, the, the neurons of the student starts to understand that they need to collaborate to fit. So if you have, for example, eight student neurons. Yeah, so the way, the, way, the way they do one. it in one neural network, they, they look at the mutual information between different layers yeah. and, and, and they, you know, but pairwise. So, mm -hmm. so it looks to me that it is familiar. It, is, it could be similar. I don't know if he has, be, has anybody made the analogy. I don't think so. I don't think they, so. They so, call it phase uh, transition. They call. They also call phase transition. Yeah, yeah. That, that's definitely. I mean, it's 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 not a sharp phase transition. It's like a kind of a, a cross a smooth crossover. Because if you if you would initialize your ODEs strictly at d equals to infinity on this plateau, you would just stay there because the fixed point of the of the ODEs. So it, it exits because uh, there is some uh, some small numerical error when you integrate the, the ODEs uh, numerically that there is a point of exiting. 
And actually, one of the very interesting questions uh, that is not yet uh, uh, answered uh, is exactly how does this point of, of, uh, of exit of the plateau scales with everything in the problem? So this is, uh, this is something that uh, we are currently looking at, but right. I so so, I, so I in, the, in the information bottleneck theory, what happens there is exactly that, that you have fluctuations. So the fluctuations mm -hmm. of that point are small, but then the, at this point, the gradients of the yeah. fluctuations are become order one. Yeah. There's a very beautiful plot that, has, that, uh, that they have in, uh, in all their papers. Uh, Naftali, uh -huh. Kibili, and yeah, others. Kishbili, and, yeah, yeah, yeah and, and his uh, offsprings. But, uh, but somehow it should be related because it's just from different perspectives, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's an interesting comment. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, so familiar with the, with the information bottleneck literature. I read uh, some of their papers, but uh, I, I never thought about this connection. Uh, um, I think it would be interesting me, to see. Excuse me, can I ask a question? This is Panos Tinis from uh, PNNL. So I, yeah. I, see, I see here that the curves that you have are in normalized mm -hmm. uh, time, right? Because it's new over D. So yeah. we see here that as you increase the dimension, the curves yeah. start going towards this uh, solid curve, which comes from the, uh, yeah. from the what do you call it? The, 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 the ODE, right? You said something the ODE, about, yeah, the, the, Right, but, the but, you, said that, but yeah. you said that if D goes to infinity, that the ODE has a fixed point. So you cannot have this kind of transition. So my question is, this mean field limit probably cannot capture this transition that you see here. Well, I guess that uh, so when, when also when you solve your ODE, you are obliged to discretize it, right? Like you cannot just solve it um, um, analytically. So um, of course this is gonna this is gonna depend on that. And you can study actually uh, how the exit point. So if you take a, if you take a, a dimension which is big enough, you can actually study how this exit point depends. Uh, for example, on a fluctuation, you can add a fluctuation. You initialize. Then in this plateau, and you add a little perturbation, and you can do perturbation theory and try to characterize exactly uh, uh, when this exit happens as a function of the fluctuation. Right, but, but fluctuations, if, I understand yeah. that fluctuations are on top of a mean field limit because the point of a mean field limit is that there are no fluctuations, right? So all I'm yeah. saying is that this looks like something that happens, for example, in phase transition. If you take the Ising model in 2D, Mm -hmm. If you do a mean field, you don't get the transition. But if you put the fluctuations, you see that yeah. there is a phase transition. So, uh, so that's there exactly has how. To be, so, so I think that this, whatever you call it, discretization error or the fact that you cannot actually use infinite number of d, actually mm -hmm. allows you, <laughs> through these implicit yeah. fluctuations, to get this phase transition. But if you yeah. could solve exactly the solution at the mean field limit, you would not see it, right? Because there are no yeah, fluctuations you, then. Yeah, if you initialize in this, yeah, if you initialize in this, in this, uh, in this fixed point, and you have- It will D stay there, infinity, right? You stay there, you stay of there. Of course, yeah. yes, okay, okay, yeah. okay, all right, thank you. And sorry, just, just let me just uh, uh, say something about the terminology yeah. because, um, so the mean field limit, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of the name. Uh, it refers to these works on the, on the PDEs, uh, that were proven when the hidden layer is very wide. Here yes. we are in the opposite limit where they are narrow. Uh, this is called, I don't know, they, they, I call just Sudden Solar 95 because uh, they, they were the pioneering work uh, to do that. Um, but I agree with you that this is also a sort of a mean field limit. Like, uh, I see, it's, I see, it's just okay. That, uh, I, I prefer to call the other ones hydrodynamic equations because they really look like Coulomb gas. You know, when you have a, a gas, of particles and you say, I don't want to track the individual particles, I want to track some density, and you write some hydrodynamic equations for the density of particles, is exactly what they are doing in the, in the so-called mean field limit. And here, instead, we are tracking uh, the, the statistics of the error that uh, you can do it exactly when d equals to infinity. Yeah, I called it mean field limit because in your previous slide, you had d going to infinity, and you called it the mean field limit. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, maybe maybe I, maybe I, maybe I, 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 maybe I have a typo go, then. I mean, may, may, can you go back because if you yeah. I, just I think uh, one you have second, saying that yes, it, it, so one, that, one forward forward no for, forward forward yes uh, one, one more one more yes here yeah oh, deterministic limit sorry not mean yeah. limit yes you're right 
Yes. Anyway, deterministic in the sense that there are no fluctuations. Yes, I didn't want. Yeah, to... but I totally, I totally, I totally get yes, your yes, point. Yes, yes, yes. I think we're I in agreement. It's just that yes, you're right to keep mean field limit as a terminology that has to do with the width of the layer and not the width of the input. Yes. It's 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 a it's a historical way they call it. Like, but, uh, I, I but actually, it also like... it, but it also makes a big difference. I mean, as a function uh, space approximation, because it's very different if you have a finite width or a, with uh, in contrast to an infinite width for the layer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, that, that's that's exactly going to be the point of our work. Uh, we're trying to to exactly bridge these uh, these two regimes. But uh, okay, uh, it's okay, kind great. of a spoiler. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. thank you. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Okay. I find great okay. if you. Uh, if you have, I, please feel free to ask. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? This is Yan Zhong yeah. from Brown. I, I might miss okay. something, but if I understand correctly, you can think of introducing zeros and without changing any function, you can increase the dimensionality. So I, if I might miss something, do you have a certain condition that prevents that the case? If that is not the case, then you can introduce a lot of these goes, even goes to infinity without changing your function. So, so you mean introducing zeros on the hidden layer or in the input? Uh, in the W star. So in the teacher network, you yeah. can first have a W stars, but you can add up more zeros and increasing dimensionality. Mm -hmm. Then so without changing function, you can have, you can let D goes to infinity. Then it seems doesn't making sense to me because the the so teacher network I, has a zero, so that basically that's a, let's say, it could be 30 dimensional function, but by introducing zeros, you can still claim that it's a like thousand dimension, 100,000 dimensionality. So is there- I think, I think that, uh, so what I need really is that, uh, I need really that this, what I call these local fields, which you can think as the pre-activation of both the teacher and the student, I need that the joint distribution of them is gonna be a Gaussian. And actually, you can show this when the covariates are Gaussian, and when probably you need to assume that they are uh, well behaved enough, the, the, the teacher weights as well. Because I need this condition to hold to be able to write uh, this limit. But that still follows the, I, I don't see any problems because by introducing zeros, you don't, I mean, lambda star is still Gaussian, but you have a dimensionality is missing somewhere. It feels like, you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like W yeah, X I, one plus yeah. zero times X two, that's D dimensional, but still give you one dimensional output. And W one X, that's still Gaussian. So by mm -hmm. introducing yeah, a lot of zeros, Gaussian, doesn't, yeah. yeah, it doesn't change anything. So that I feel like something is missing somewhere. Well, you're changing that you're changing that at some point your K, which I call K here, which is the the the, the teacher hidden hidden layer. Yeah, K, K can be not... fixed, but uh, if I'm talking about input. So K can be fixed, but inside lambda yeah. can be yeah. W1, X1 plus zero times X2, then that's now two dimensional, but mm -hmm. it's basically one dimensional. Okay. And that's so still Gaussian. Where typically you're just adding zeros, so nothing changed, but you can let dimension goes to infinity by keep introducing zeros. So, Okay. Then basically you are changing, you, the, our data is fixed, then you are student network keep increasing dimension. Then if this is still hold, then I think something is wrong or I might misunderstood somewhere. So you want to keep D fixed or you want to keep K fixed? K is fixed, D is, is increasing, fixed. but teacher yes. network doesn't change a bit because your W stars, just adding zeros for the next increasing dimensionality. So I'm comparing W1 star X1 versus W1, uh, W1 star X1 plus W, uh, W2 star being zero, X2 plus zero times X3, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So then you're adding zeros. Yeah, the input is keep adding zeros, then you can keep increasing the dimensionality while mm -hmm. you keep the, your training data to be the same as all dimension. I mean, 
dimension one, for example. But you are keep increasing teacher's dimension, I mean, the student's dimension, because assuming we don't know what is teacher, mm -hmm. then if it still works through, and I feel like something is missing. I, 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 need, I need both of them, I need both of them, both inputs of them to scale like D. Uh, yeah, sure, you can do that, but the W star being zero, all but finitely many. Oh, but you know, you many? understand my, yeah, so like W1 star is not zero, but starting from W2 star, you can set all zeros. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, I think that I don't want to take too much of time. Okay, but, okay, uh, I, I'm going to think, think, I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think I about think, it. I, I think you sure. get my point. I think you get my point. I, I think I think you, I think I get your point, and I think there should be a problem in the assumptions of how you prove this uh, that doesn't allow uh, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure, going to think. Sure. I'm going to think through it, uh, and uh, and uh, we can follow up if you yeah, if you want. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let me try to move uh, forward. So I was speaking about both plateaus. The first one being the unspecialized plateau. And the second one is the specialized plateau when actually you start to collaborate between each other. And um, what it was shown in these works is that this plateau is governed by the noise level. So if you don't have noise level, you achieve zero population uh, risk. But if you have a noise, then you're gonna get stuck in a plateau which is proportional to the learning rate times the noise level. So, okay, that's just a, a also result back from back then. Okay, so, uh, the motivation for our, for our work um, was to try to bridge these two regimes. So we would, would like to, to see how to go from the narrow networks where we have um, order one uh, hidden layer and diverging input dimension towards the wide neural networks where you have fixed input layer and diverging uh, uh, hidden dimension. Of course, like, Making this, 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 uh, knowing what happens here in the middle is a very, very, very tough problem. And I think our work doesn't completely solve this problem. So there is still uh, uh, some, something to be done. But we, I would say that we do the first epsilon towards moving from the narrow side towards, towards the wide side. So let me just give a, a feeling of what is the difference between uh, uh, the sudden solar work and our work is that in the sudden solar, uh, the input dimension was going to infinity while I'm keeping K, P, and the learning rate of order one. Instead, what we did is like to extend their, uh, their framework. When D goes to infinity still, K is still remains order one. So the teacher hidden layer is still order one. But now I have the student hidden layer, P, scaling with D. So I'm going more towards what in the mean field limit calls under uh, overparameterized. So here you need to be careful because there are two notions of overparameterization. There is one notion which is I have a lot of uh, hidden units. So compared to input dimensions, that's one notion that people use. So if my uh, middle layer is much larger than my first layer, and there's a second notion which is from the complexity of the target function. So if I have more uh, more uh, parameters on the student than on the teacher, that's a different notion of overparameterization because I have a function class which is more complex than the one that generated the target function. So we are overparameterized with respect to this notion, but we are not going to be overparameterized with respect to the second notion, to the one in which uh, uh, the input is still going to infinity and p is scaling with d. And also, you're going to take the learning rates to scale like d minus one over delta. And then uh, we are going to discuss the different regimes for these exponents kappa and delta. So the main theoretical result uh, is going to be very similar from the one before. Uh, we are going to show that the uh, stochastic process of the moments of um, the sufficient statistics that characterize the generalization error, uh, when d goes to infinity, converge towards a deterministic limit described by an ODD. And this ODD depends, of course, on the scaling of kappa and delta, so of the learning rate and the size of the hidden layer compared to the number of input dimensions. And here, uh, uh, again, like the number of samples I've seen is going to be dependent on tau, a constant, over delta t, where delta t is going to be uh, my, um, my step size that I'm going to take to be the maximum between these two things. So that's something that uh, enters in the theorem and is important. Okay, so 
now, but now maybe it's good. Before we didn't look at how these equations look like, but here I'm gonna uh, give a little zoom towards the equations. Um, how does it look like? So it looks like like so Q is the entries of the correlation between two neurons of uh, the student, while M is the correlation between the neurons of the student and the teacher. So I have an ODE for both of them. And that's how this would look like. Um, the one for the self-correlation, so the student-student correlation, has two terms. One is a learning term, and one is a noise term. And the one of the student-student overlap has only a learning term on it. And everything is going to depend on the interplay between the learning term and the noise term. So OK, I'm not giving the explicit expressions for i for the learning, the noise term in both cases, but these are just simple things to compute. So once you have that, you can start uh, uh, characterizing how the different learning regimes look like with respect to kappa and delta. So uh, the main result is this diagram. And now the goal is to go through this diagram so that you don't understand the different regimes on the diagram. So the first regime, the first regime that we'd like to speak about um, is the red one, which is actually the one I'm not going to care too much. In this regime, when uh, kappa plus delta is less than one half, uh, we don't have ODEs. So we don't manage to define a, a time that goes to zero such that you converge to a deterministic limit. So that's a, that's, that's a regime that we cannot say anything. So we are not going to speak about this regime. Now, the other three regimes are regimes in which you have well-defined uh, deterministic limits when you take D to infinity, scaling both the hidden dimension and uh, the learning rate uh, uh, with the input dimension. So the first uh, point I would like to mention is this uh, blue point in this line, which is exactly the sudden solar regime. It's exactly when delta and kappa are equal to zero, you recover the ODEs from sudden solar. And how does it look like? The phenomenology is exactly like the one of the plot that I showed you before. You have two plateaus. You have one plateau, which is the uh, um, specialization plateau, and one which is the unspecialized plateau. And uh, depending on the noise level, you can get to zero error. Or if you have a finite noise level, you don't get to zero error. It's exactly the same thing. And our first result is to say that we can extend this sudden solar result to this whole blue line. So actually, uh, this phenomenology not only holds for the point delta kappa equals to zero, but holds for all uh, uh, kappa plus delta equals to zero. So not both of them being zero, but the sum of them being zero. And you're going to get exactly this kind of curve depending on your noise level. So same phenomenology as before. Now, so, things yeah, start to get... Yeah. So, okay, can you clarif clarify a little bit? What do we mean by perfect learning? What do we mean by better learning? Yeah, okay. So that's a, that's a good question. So uh, I'm going to show plots for you to understand what bad learning uh, uh, means. But perfect learning is, uh, is uh, easy to grasp. It's like you're going to be able to achieve zero population risk, even if you have noise in your problem. <clears throat> Okay, then from a figure here, so if the data is zero, uh, data is positive, then I always have perfect learning, right? No matter what the kappa value. The only condition is the data is positive. Yeah, 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 exactly. So you can have perfect learning both having kappa equals to zero, so not scaling your hidden layer, but changing your learning rate with delta bigger than zero. That's, that's, that's one option for you to achieve perfect learning. But you could then also uh, over parameterize, over parameterize. You can also increase your hidden dimension. So I'm going to be careful here because uh, of the two notions of overparameterization. But you can also increase your hidden dimension, and uh, and uh, having your learning rates to be slightly uh, less than zero. So you could you could there are many ways you can be in this uh, in this uh, green region. Yes, but uh, it's a little bit let's say anti my intuition because uh, if the learning rate the delta is positive, so which means I can always have perfect learning. It seems, uh, let's say, too good to be true. Uh. Uh, yeah, that, 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 follows from, that follows from the equations. So from the deterministic equations of, uh, of uh, because in this regime is exactly when uh, the noise term doesn't contribute and you have just a learning term and this learning term dominates. And actually, uh, I'm going to show uh, some plots where, uh, again, in these plots, like the, 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 the solid line, is uh, is the ODE the solution of the ODE, and the dots here are uh, finite size simulations. 
but there is a catch here, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm answering also to what Lou said, because if yeah. delta is greater than zero, if you go back one slide, yeah, right, your learning rate as d goes to infinity goes to zero. So in order to achieve perfect learning, basically it will take more forever. Data. It will take forever, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, you take so more time. Is, so, so even though in principle you can achieve perfect learning, if your delta is large enough, in order to, to get this perfect learning, it will take a very, very long time. Yeah, that's, okay. that's, that, that's, a, that, that's a point I, I, I was going to make later, is that there is a fundamental trade-off, because also the time, since we are doing one pass SGD, the time is proportional to the quantity of data. So mm -hmm. you need to see much more data to actually achieve perfect learning if you want to put uh, your delta uh, very large. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. So you need much more information. So you, it, it, there is a trade-off between, um, in some sense, over-parameterization in the sense of a big hidden layer and a learning rate. So if you want to put your learning rate smaller, you can increase the number. What, what you'd like to be, uh, you'd like to be close to the, to the blue line. So you'd like to be close to a point where delta is as small as possible, uh, uh, but not touching the blue line, because otherwise you don't, don't get perfect learning. So like an epsilon outside of the blue line is a good place to be. Uh, can I clarify something here? So yeah, this diagram shows the when D goes to infinity and you get the yeah. ODE and the, what that ODE can do or not, right? If I understand correctly, the learning part, if the green regime, you just ignore the noisy part so that you can able to get a perfect learning. And Plato, you have a balanced term so that you both can survive. And bad learning, you have a, the learning part disappear. You only have a noisy part. And no OD yeah. part, you don't get any OD. That's my understanding. Is that correct? So yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the red part, you don't get an OD. In the orange part, you do get an OD. But it's an OD that stays forever at no learning. I'm, I'm going to speak about it uh, after. Like Basically, since you only have the noisy part, remember that the teacher-student correlation depends only on the learning part, doesn't depend on the noise part. So the, right, the, right, the, right. The, the teacher only correlates with the student, sorry, the other way around. The student only correlates to the teacher um, if the learning part is not going to go to zero. So in some sense, uh, uh, in the orange region is bad learning in this sense. You don't correlate with uh, your signal. You still have a non-trivial dynamics because the OD is I driven see. by the noise, but it's not, it's not a good, uh, you, you're not learning anything really because yeah. you don't correlate with the signal. So um, I think that's a good moment to show this slide, which is like the, uh, an example of the green region uh, where the ODE is still the solid line. And here, if you do finite size, uh, finite instance simulations, because your, uh, your, um, your noise term is never exactly equals to zero, even for finite D, there is always a noise term that is proportional to the, to the learning rate, then, uh, you to get actually to zero, you need to increase a lot your system size. And that's exactly what we see here. So if we do a plot where uh, we plot the plateau, the last plateau, the specialized plateau for uh, uh, as a function of D in a log scale, we see exactly that the plateau here is scaling as D to the minus delta, where delta is the, is the, the way the learning rate scales. So it's going to zero, but for any finite D, you would still have this plateau. It's only when D is really, really large that you get closer and closer to zero, that you are really fitting all your noise. So uh, that's for the green region. And uh, now let me show you a plot about the orange region, because this is a very weird region. It's a region where uh, delta plus kappa uh, can be, uh, can be uh, negative. And in this region, that's the kind of behavior you see. So you have a... Uh, uh, you have, uh, still the solid line being the result of the ODEs, it's completely driven by the noise, by the noise term, you have no learning. But uh, if you do a finite instance simulation, again, uh, you're gonna have a learning turn and eventually, uh, if D is finite, you're gonna learn something. And it's only when D is very, very large that actually uh, the learning term goes to zero and then uh, your stochastic process is completely dominated uh, by the, by the uh, deterministic uh, noise term. And here uh, we can see that from our theorem, we, I mean, I'm not showing you this, you here, this is uh, some of the mathematical details. In the theorem, we have exactly the rate of convergence of the ODE to the deterministic limit. 
So in this case of the orange curve, we see that the convergence of the random correlation matrix to the, uh, to the deterministic one uh, scales like a log one over one half plus delta kappa. So the more delta kappa is close, is negative and close to one half. So the closer you are to the red region, the stronger is your finite size effect. And that's exactly what you observe in these curves here for the orange region. So, okay. Uh, that discussion, I think uh, uh, we already had. There is a, also from the ODEs, you can see there is a fundamental trade off between the quantity of data uh, you need to see and your learning rate. So, if you fix your, uh, your architecture, so if you fix a, a certain kappa and uh, you say that I want to lower my learning rate by a factor d to the minus delta, I would need to see d to the delta samples uh, to get to the same place. So that's exactly a, a figure that shows uh, different uh, deltas. So you're comparing different deltas for the same d uh, and for the same noise. And you see that if I go from gamma not scaling with d to gamma scaling like one over d square root, then I add a number of steps, which is proportional to d to the one half. So that's exactly showing that. Um, OK, so just to summarize uh, here and uh, uh, to wrap up, so we have characterized uh, uh, the phase diagram for, um, for SG, one pass SGD, um, in the limit where we have d going to infinity, so the imp input dimension going to infinity, and uh, extended the previous results, which were for fixed hidden layer and for fixed learning rate, to uh, learning rates and, uh, and, uh, and a hidden uh, layer that can scale with the input dimension. And we have observed different regimes according to how you scale. And uh, here is a summary of how the ODE looks like in these three different regimes where you have a well-defined deterministic ODE. Uh, here I'm plotting adjusting the time so that all of the curves uh, start in the same place. So uh, my conclusion is, we have an exact deterministic theory for one pass SGD for two layer neural networks in the high dimensional input uh, limit. Uh, wide hidden layer helps achieving perfect learning, but it's not the only way. And uh, the full phase diagram describing the crossover between the different regimes. So, okay, I, I guess there were many questions, but if you have more, uh, I'm happy to keep discussing uh, for the time that we have left. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. It's a good discussion already. So uh... yeah, I, I just wanted the I just wanted the, uh, uh, the 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 name of the person who made the sorry because I didn't see the, the the video, but the person who made the point about the the yeah. So let me just uh, let me just uh, take note of uh, of your name so I can follow up with you. Yeah, thank you. My name is Yan Jong. Yeah, I'm 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 writing so you can I probably can find your email online, right? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Actually, I have a, one quick question. So, sure. I, I actually two questions. It seems to me that this framework can be further generalized to general function approximation perspective, considering in uh, utilizing the universal approximations here for two layer neural network. Then teacher network can be any continuous function if you can allow some room for the error in your dynamics. And do you think okay. would it be possible to generalize it, the teacher-student network to the function approximation context regime? So the function approximation if, is, is the mean field one, the one uh, in which you have the PDs for the densities or? Ah, so what I mean by function approximation is that you don't now have a teacher, yeah. but you now have a continuous function plus noise. Okay. Then you can think of teacher network, there is a certain K that approximate the continuous functions in a certain level. Then you are basically changing your teacher, it, uh, I mean, output, the uh, output of your data, which is a teacher network, mm -hmm. is continuous function plus error term, which is controlled by some by epsilon, by universal okay. approximation and the noise. Then I think, would we, do you think it would be possible that your research still remains to be whole, allowing some epsilon part so that somehow basically can you handle your discrete density, not, not randomness 
discrepancy, but it's somehow deterministic discrepancy out of it. So if, I if that the is the, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I think if that is the case, I think this framework can be further generalized in the context of the function approximation. Because the some, you know, you, you may you may probably heard of many times that some some people always complains about a teacher network is too restrictive, etc. So that yeah, I really enjoyed your framework and enjoyed your talk. Where by the way, I forgot to mention the very first <laughs> I really enjoyed. But I think that might be interesting to think about how you can incorporate those kind of epsilon part so, so that extending to the function approximation context. So let me let me maybe throw the question back to you. Because I think it, 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 all, it all boils down on whether you can, uh, if you know how to characterize the joint statistics right. of the labels, so the label, so now we don't have a teacher, if I understand correctly, you have, a, you have a target function plus some, some noise. And mm -hmm. if you can characterize the statistics of, of your labels, how they correlate with the pre-activations of the, of the student, mm -hmm. I would say that yes, but... Uh, is there a setting where you think you can do that? Like, uh, uh, like what would be the most gen most generic assumption in, in, in from from your perspective, such that you can actually track the statistics of a Y joint with uh, uh, with um, with the pre oh, I see. So, I see. Because let me uh, let me go back to the point where I think is most relevant to your question. Mm -hmm. Oh God, I think I went too much. <laughs> now I can stop it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, everything's under control, I hope. Okay, I, I lost control of my computer. It's like starting to, uh, to do all the animations again. Okay, yeah, I think that's the relevant uh, slide. Is that right. it's going from this step, this step. So I would imagine that you would put a Y here instead of one over K sum over R, right? right. And the key step is to change, is to change uh, this average over X which characterizes the population risk mm -hmm. to an average over the joint distribution of the pre-activations. So here we know that because our data is Gaussian, so yeah, it's restrictive because uh, we are assuming something about the process that generated the data, mm -hmm. um, it allows us to be sharp. So we, we can tell you that the error is 0 0.5 if- Ah, uh, I see, so I see. It's not I down. See. But, but it's an interesting question because probably there is a room, there is room for generalizing this for, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a line of work that we have been doing in our group here is to try to, to exactly to lighten the, 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 the assumptions of teacher student models over the, the structure of the input data like to put more and more structure and to see, we, we are not into the point where you can put something genetic, but we are in a point where we can put some uh, universality class. Like uh, we know that there is some sort of labels that uh, fall within a certain Gaussian universality class that uh, we can do this kind of characterizations. There, is, there are some works on that as well, but it's yes. not as sharp, I think, as, as, what, as what you're suggesting. I see. Yeah, thank you. I think we can talk a little bit more on, over email. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I ask one more question? Yes, Pavel. Yeah, of yeah, course. Sure. So what happens if you add one more hidden layer to your analysis? Ah. I mean, what will happen to your analysis? Have you tried to add one more layer? I think that that, that question, I, I, I'm going to give exactly the same answer as I, I gave to Yan Zhong, which is uh, it all boils down whether you manage to characterize uh, these statistics. So. So one thing that we know we, how, we know how to do is to is to train the last layer. That's possible. So the, the one over P that I put here, okay. actually I can train because these are just scalars. They are okay. order one uh, with uh, with P. If you if you are in, in the sudden solar regime where these are all constants, uh, this can be done. But if you want to go deeper, like two hidden layers, then right. it, then we don't know how to characterize this statistic. So. It would all, all boil down to whether you can control uh, the joint statistics of the labels together with the, the pre-activations of each layer. And maybe you can think about having a conditioning where you first condition on one layer and you characterize the joint statistics. But since you are training both layers, the joint statistics are also changing. They are not staying Gaussian. You could try to approximate that. We, we have tried but, to do this in the past. 
Okay, but here, what is what is Gaussian here is the lambdas, right? In the sense that it's the lambdas, sigma yeah. that the sigma does not have Gaussian statistics, right? Because it is no. It, so all I'm saying is that you already have a difficulty there. So what would happen is that you take these sigmas and you fit them again into a second layer. So how how what I'm trying to understand is how adding one layer and maybe later more layers gets you away from the from the from the statistics that you have for one layer. So is there something progressive there that you can do by doing some kind of systematic expansion? I think that's I think that's a that's a very good question. But the uh, the, the the main bottleneck from a technical perspective I can give to you, which is that the sigmas they are jointly Gaussian throughout the whole dynamics. So we just need two moments to characterize that. Why now, why, add, why 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 is sigma Gaussian? Sorry, sorry, not sigma lambdas. lambdas ah, okay, my, okay, my yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. So we just need the second moments to actually track the dynamics. Okay. Now, if you add another layer, so you add, a, let's say, another sigma, right, a vector dot product with sigma of lambda, right. Now you would need you would need the statistics of of this other lambda, so lambda tilde, which is the new weights times sigma of something right but everything will why can you keep the expectation uh, that you have there over the lambda star and the lambda nu but it is of more complicated functions all i'm saying yeah. is instead of trying to find first the statistics of these sigmas and then okay. fit them again into one more layer why yeah. don't you bring everything back to the initial you know input where you have just the lambdas so th that's a good point i think I think that uh, this this framework is totally generalizable to any distribution of uh, of lambda as long as you have enough equation tracking the the moments of this distribution. So that if you have a fourth moment, you have to track the fourth moment and so on. Um, now the question maybe is whether you can characterize that throughout the dynamics, like in an iterative way, as we were saying. If this if this is true, it would be extremely nice. But I see that the the, the technical difficulty yes would be some kind of a Conditionally, first you find the statistics of sigma. So first lambda, then you then sigma of lambda, then you condition on that, and then you find of uh, the new weights times, and you update maybe in an ordered way. That could be maybe possible. Uh, yeah, the 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 way I I, I would understand it if you press one more to to show the equation for omega, right? Uh, what, what what I expect is that if you add a second layer you can still write down an equation for omega, but the psi will be more complex now, right? Yes, the, the psi would be more complex. The, yes. the psi would be more complex, but, you, but, but, but if you can uh, reduce all the expectations only with respect to lambda star and lambda nu, I think that you can still probably write down an equation for omega but with a more complex psi. So it will make that more complicated, do you, but. Do you agree with me that the distribution of, um, the distribution of, um, of, the, of the inner, of the outer layer, so the one which is the dot product between the new weights you're introducing times uh, the sigma of lambda, this is changing with, uh, with time. That is, that is changing with time, but, but all I'm saying is that that will be a function of the omega. So if you can track omega and you know what this function is, you can you, you can keep track of what is happening between the two hidden layers. Uh, yeah, maybe. Because here, for example, you still have something which is non-Gaussian, right? The statistics of sigma. But, yeah. but you are able to track omega and then say something about the approximation properties of the one hidden layer network. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Would all boil down whether you can probably do this this uh, this uh, condition and keep track of uh, the statistics of of all of these, uh, like let's say, uh, um, how do you call that? Like uh, hourglass. Like you always you condition on the lambda, then you, com you compute the statistics of lambda, then progressively you you track up 
up to finding the statistics of the labels, which give you the error. Exactly. And the question is, exactly. Yeah. And, and here you do it already, right? But it's for one layer. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, so, uh, Manos, maybe maybe you can uh, bring this off offline. Uh, yes, yes. Another yes. email. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, right. Bruno, thank you very much, just of us, for your information. We had actually um, Grant Rotskov giving a talk on his stuff uh, three years, mm -hmm. three and a half years ago here. Oh, wow. Brown. And then we had also Justin Sirignano this year, uh -huh. and Spiliopoulos. We had him as a speaker. A couple of times, so uh, so uh, so there's uh, nice. <laughs> everybody goes through crunch. <laughs> okay, that's very nice. I could I could have skipped the introduction actually. Then. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good. Uh, Everything is good, and they generated a lot of uh, interest. Thank you very much, and also say hello to Lenka, who's uh, invited. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you again yeah. for this invitation for the very nice discussion. Uh, it was very lively. Uh, so, so maybe you can we can proceed to uh, show you. Okay, I'll, I'll need to go. Sorry, because here yep, is thank, well, thank, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for your presentation. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, so let's move to the second talk. So our second speaker is Xu Yu Zhu, who is who is an assistant professor from University of Iowa, the Department of Mathematics. He's also affiliate, uh, <coughs> affiliated with an interdisciplinary PhD program in applied math and computational science. Uh, our speaker is, in fact, a Brown alumni. He obtained his PhD in applied math in 2013 from Brown University, after which he went to University of Utah for uh, postdoctoral work. His research interests include uh, computational math, scientific computing, uh, uncertainty quantification, model reduction, and scientific machine learning. So without further ado, let's welcome our second speaker. So you may want to start. Yeah, I I can't share my screen. Oh, sorry. Is, okay. I'll make you co-host. Okay, thank you. Two. Oh, no. Okay, let me see. Okay, okay. Thank you for the invitation from George, and thank you for the introduction. Uh. So very, I'm very happy to uh, even back to Brown remotely. So it reminds a lot of me, a uh, lot of my memory, a uh, day and night spent at the basement to debugging the codes. Okay, <laughs> just some kidding <laughs> Co uh, jokes. So uh, today I will give a talk on the physics informed neural network for learning uh, the homogenized coefficient for multi-scale elliptic equations. So this is a joint work, uh, recent work joint with uh, joint work with my uh, postdoc uh, Richard Park at uh, UIOA. So he's also in the audience. So if you have a lot of uh, detailed questions, so he might help to answer on that. Okay. So today I will first give a, a short introduction to the homogenization and the G limit, which is the uh, the homogenized coefficient, and then I will talk about uh, uh, the problem setup or formulation for uh, our approach. And I will then I will talk about using pin to uh to uh for learning the the homogeneous coefficient of G limit. Then I will show some numerical result to demonstrate uh the the applicability of the approach and the performance of the approach. Okay. So as many uh, uh, of you already know that there is a wide range of scientific engineering problems that involve multi-scale uh phenomena. So if you use traditional approach to directly do the simulation, numerical simulation on those uh, uh, physics or engineering problems, it is very expensive. So a lot of people are trying to develop the, the reduced model or effective model in order to account for the uh, micro scale effect, but still can solve those model in a much uh, reduced cost. So in our context, uh, we are interested in the, the, the multi-scale uh, elliptic equation. For example, this is the 1D multi-scale elliptic equation. And here the A epsilon is the multi-scale coefficient. And uh, you can say this one is a, a so you, product. I think you, you, didn't re, you didn't advance your slides. We cannot see oh. it. Oh, Did, can you see that? No. No. Hey, we can only see the first page oh. of your PDF. Uh, that's interesting. Let me see that. Oh, no, we can see the. Yeah, yeah, but when I make it a full screen. It seems that everyone can not see that. Uh, now we can see the second multi scale, the motivation. Now we can see the. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but when I make the full screen, it seems everyone can not see that. So 
it's just, right now it's okay or uh, yeah, 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 right one, one more okay. one more oh, one more okay yeah yeah okay okay so now okay. we're good yeah 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 okay so uh so just yeah so for example this one D multi scale uh elliptic equation we have this uh, a epsilon so this is one example of the a epsilon so you can see that this is a local periodic cases and this epsilon will control the micro scale oscillation uh in this problem in the solution and in the uh, also in the in the in the coefficient the challenge again is if you try to use finite element to solve this problem using the very fine mesh, you have to use the very fine mesh in order to account for a very small epsilon. So it, uh, the degree freedom you have to use is, very, is a, a lot. So usually it's very expensive. So one way uh, people to, to try to deal with this problem trying this is through the homogenization. Uh, well, there's a lot of theory about homogenization, but I want to just talk about a general idea about that. So the idea of homogenization in uh, in this case, uh, in the uh, multi-scale elliptic equation is just that they want to develop the homogenized limit of this equation as epsilon goes to zero so that they can get the following homogenized equation, which now you can see that the uh, the coefficient from go from a epsilon to a star. A star is so-called the g-limit or the, or the homogenized coefficient. And this coefficient is not depends uh, on the micro, micro scale. It's only dependent on the macro scale. Okay. And then if we solve, we can if we solve this equation, the u zero will be our homogenized coefficient. And this one, if we can have, if we can even if we can have this model, it will be much easier or cheaper to solve uh, to compare to the solving the multi scale elliptic equation directly. Um, that's that's one of the multiple motivation people want to develop this homogenized uh, model or equation so those u0 homogenized equation will be a good approximation of the multi-scale solution when epsilon is uh, small okay so to uh, to reiterate the goal of the homogenized uh, homogenization um at least in the uh, multi-scale elliptic uh, literature so they want to find the homogenized coefficient a star for this homogenized model homogenized equation uh, to give some uh, uh, intuition about this, uh, uh, the behavior the home, uh, of the multi-scale solution or my, uh, the home genus solution. I, so here I have a one, left, uh, the left figure is uh, the red, red plot, uh, red, red line is uh, the multi-scale coefficient. You can see it's quite oscillatory. However, if you look, if you look at the, the home genus coefficient, it's quite smooth, right? It's quite smooth. And now the corresponding, uh, uh, multi scale solution, you can see it's still right. So you can see that there's some uh, slow variation because the epsilon we, we put here is not very small. So you can still see the small oscillation uh, around the U0, which is a homogeneous solution, which is a blue line, right? Blue line is quite smooth. There's no oscillation on that. So the general impression you can, uh, I want to deliver is that uh, the homogeneous coefficient, you you can capture the macros, microscopic behavior, which is smooth, of the uh, the, the oscillatory uh, multi-scale solution, which is u epsilon. So this is something we, intuition we, we want to use later on. So that's why I want to show this plot. Okay. Now, traditional way to uh, to do the homogenization, they usually require the periodicity assumption for this uh, uh, multi-scale coefficient. So basically, they assume that uh, this coefficient is uh, uh, is periodic with this with respect to x over epsilon in some periodic uh, periodic uh, cell, and they have to develop this local cell problem for each of the location in the periodic uh, in the in the in the spatial domain with a periodic boundary condition. So you have to in general you have to solve a lot of uh, local cell problem in order to uh, get your li uh, the uh, the g limit or homogeneous coefficient. Okay. That's the traditional, uh, the major, uh, I would say, the mainstream method. Of course, there are some uh, methods that can handle the cases, which is non periodic cases, uh, but in general, in general, so the main challenge for uh, homogenization uh, is that either it's not given a new problem, which is not, is not in the non period in, in the non periodic cases or non standard cases, it's not clear how to get from a epsilon, the multi-scale coefficient to the, um, the homogeneous coefficient, the a star, or it's, it's non-trivial to do the extension. Either it's not, not clear, 
or it's not trivial to do that, or it's very difficult to do that. So, so that's the uh, state. That's the current limitation of the uh, the traditional homogenous uh, homogenization uh, approach. Now, uh, so as we many people in here already noticed that so there's a there's a very fast uh, uh, development in the machine using machine learning. Uh, given data, trying to develop a reduced model or effective model in in various contexts or uh, uh, community. For example, uh, you at Lee High, so he used the machine learning techniques to find the cost screen the non-local model from the uh, the the high fidelity multi-skill data. I think this is a recent work. Uh, I see a serious work on this on this direction. Also, George collaborated with his uh, uh, his uh, collaborator. Uh, try to re uh, try to recovering the effective uh, primitivity uh, parameters from the uh, the scattering data in the uh, inverse scattering uh, electromagnetic problems. It's also a multi scale problem, but the multi scale nature is different slightly. It's different uh, with the multi scale uh, elliptic equation. Okay, and one uh, more relevant uh, literature uh, to our context in the multi scale elliptic uh, problem. So, is the, the Abdullah has uh, in the EPFL, uh, he has two papers. They're trying to recover the multi scale coefficient from the noisy multi scale solution data. And they have, but they have to use the, the, uh, the known Holmes Nice model to do that. So, which, uh, so it, so here you have some that have some limitation because in some of the setting, so you don't know how to get a star. So how to from got uh, get uh, from a homogenized coefficient to uh, the um, the home uh, from the multi scale coefficient to a homogenized coefficient still is not clear. Okay. So, but motivated by those uh, development, so there's a lot of other literature. So just uh, trying to uh, name uh, try to name a few so that uh, I'm familiarized. Okay. So motivated by this recent development in this direction, so we want to consider the following problem. We still want to consider the the following elliptic multi scale uh, equation, and but we want to remove the dependence on the we need the a y uh, the multi scale coefficient to to be uh, periodic. We don't we want to remove this assumption. Okay, that's one of our goal. So. In this case, we're trying to uh, uh, look at this uh, problem in terms of if you are you are given data, so now this problem become a inverse problem. So we want to learn the G limit uh, or homogenized coefficient a star, and uh, meanwhile we want to learn the corresponding home homogenized coefficient if some data is given. Okay, I will talk about what data could be available for us. Okay, and our wish list is trying to say is that uh, we don't. We want to. We don't need the the periodicity or explicit formula of from the uh, uh of the multi scale coefficient a epsilon. We don't want that because that will cause a little bit more trouble. Sometimes, if your let's say, uh, if your data is come from um, uh, from sensor, you basically don't know what is the a epsilon. So, if we if a, if a math if approach or method framework don't need the the explicit formula for uh, the multi scale coefficient that will be very good. Okay. Okay. So how do we do that? So now, uh, so we have this. So based on the uh, the uh, classical homogenized uh, theory, at least in the multi scale elliptic equation. So when we actually know the structure of the homogenized uh, equation, the only thing we don't know is the the homogenized coefficient. Now let's say if we have the U zero data, the homogenized uh, solution data, this one will be relatively standard problem, easy problem to solve because this data uh, is is uh, is uh, consistent with the, the uh, with the, the equation. Okay, and a star again is a smooth coefficient. In general, it's relatively easy to 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 uh, to estimate a star or learning a star from the data. The question is that what could be the option for data? Okay, uh, if you recall the literature I show here, so most of the data I believe they are using the uh, the 
multi-scale solution data. So now the question is that, is this one is a, can we use this uh, multi-scale data as a surrogate for the home denied solution data? So I think the answer, the possible answer is yes, at least when each one is small. If you recall the, the, uh, the multi-scale, uh, the, the simple illustration of the, the G limit and the home denied solution I showed in the beginning of the slides. So you can see that the red line is the multi-scale solution and U0 blue line is the home denied solution. Well, virtually they look the, almost the same and the U0 is very captured the, the majors, uh, I would say, major behavior, Markov behavior of the, uh, uh, of the Markov scale solution. So in that sense, the, uh, the Markov scale solution can be a screw surrogate of the home genetic solution also, at least when epsilon is small. So of course, there are some issue in this case, if you use multi scale data, uh, trying to, you learn this A star, the home denied coefficient from the, uh, the home, uh, from the multi scale data, because the data itself is, you can say there's still some mismatch. This is a noise free cases. Uh, the, you still have some mismatch due to the multi scale os uh, fluctuation or oscillation. Or if you measure from a sensor, so you, you have a both, multi scale oscillation or fluctuation and the noise oscillation. So there's some mis uh, data mismatch in there. If you want to uh, use that to learn the, uh, the home genetic coefficient through this home, gen home genetic co uh, equation. Okay. Now, that means you need a little bit more regular regularization, particularly uh, if we can build, we can use the, the uh, physics informed regularization, that will be good. So. Uh, so that's why we want to use the, the, the physical informed neural network developed by George and the, uh, the, in the crunch group. So- Can I, uh, can I ask yes. a quick question in the previous slide? Yes. So if you can access to the multi-scale solution data, many, many data, then would it be local average would give you some close to the homogenized solution data directly? Uh, you you can, but not every case is just doing averaging will work. I see. Yeah. So, so are you assuming your data is not too many on the right. multi-scale solution? Uh, right now, it depends. So uh, right now, at least for our problem, since we only capture the uh, macroscale be macroscopic behavior, we observed that we didn't use quite a lot of data, at least for uh, uh, 1D. Oh, like 1D. We, didn't, we didn't use a lot of compared to the epsilon. Yeah, if you consider, consider the epsilon, epsilon usually is very small. So if you try to solve it for forward problem using the uh, traditional finite element, it can take a, a lot of data, oh, mesh point. Okay. Thank That's you. A, okay. That's a question. Uh, can I follow up on uh, show, show you can yeah. I, on that point? Because if you actually have the multi-scale solution, mm -hmm. you can find the correlation length. If you find okay. the correlation length, you can do a perfect averaging and you can get the uh, homogenized solution you not. So so if you have lots of data, multi-scale data. Yeah, uh, that might be a good point, but is that it works for general cases always? I mean, that's my question. Uh, I'm not sure that can we can, uh, for general setting, can we always do that? Maybe, maybe that's a good question. For the case for equation seven, definitely. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, um, yeah, but you can, later you can say the data we use is not, is compared to the epsilon size is quite small. So it's not, it's uh, far from the one over epsilon. So that's what I can see, okay. Um, but that's a good question. I need to think about more about that. Okay. But don't go with the epsilon. That's what I'm saying. Don't go with the epsilon to, for the average. Go with the correlation length that you, the two point correlation, which you can actually discover from your data. Oh, okay. You can compute okay. from your yeah, data. Yeah, okay. that, that was my point. So do a smart averaging. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Question. Yeah. And uh, sorry. And, and also um, a typical issue that uh, pops up here. I mean, not in this plot, but you have to. Of you, you are faced with boundary layers of different uh, scales. And uh -huh. There could be also in the macro scale. 
Uh, and if you are simply averaging your solution, you, you won't have somehow you would average out boundary layers. So this, yeah. this could be a topic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the for the comment. Yeah. And okay, so we can continue from here. So the 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 uh so here since we talk about this can be reformulated as a parameter estimation problem here and of course we need some uh the regularization that's why i think pin will be a very good uh to uh to use for us so in general we will first make the uh the u0 and a star by two separate neural network here and in this case uh we have some data you can see uh, our our network first made U zero, but the data we have is multi scale data, okay? And then we will we want to put the the the, the regularization, which is a PD loss. Instead of putting the multi scale equation directly, we want to put the uh, the homogeneous equation here. So which is uh, okay? Go back. Which is this term? Okay, which is this term? This can help to. Uh, this can help the, the neural network to promote the homogenized solution for for in order for uh, pin to do a good approximation on the uh, um, homogenized solution and the corresponding homogenized coefficient, and that's the major. Uh, I would say I want we want to touch the to change the pin formulation, but I'll try to use a different way as before, uh, from different way. Okay, and uh, and. Here, uh, this, the, this is the data. And in this case, uh, we mainly consider the boundary condition is uh, directly boundary condition is easy to impose because we want to focus on that. If a pin can help without the boundary condition issue, can we consider, can, within the current framework, can pin helps to capture the homogeneous coefficient and capture the, the homogenized uh, solution behavior? Okay, that's the, our major question. So we basically consider two scenario, uh, which is practical. So we consider first cases is uh, in our numerical uh, test. So what we consider first cases is, A is known, is known, and we have the numerical corresponding multi-scale solver, forward solver, okay? We can generate multi-scale data, which is uh, noise-free. Now the question is that the, the practical uh, aspect for this one is that even though you know A epsilon, you may not necessarily know how to get from a epsilon to a star. So in general, for a general setting, non-periodic, non-periodical uh, setting or non-standard setting, so from a epsilon to a star is not clear. There's no clear theoretical framework how to go from there. Or even you can set up the uh, the local problem. Sometimes it takes quite uh, effort to find set up the right local problem. Okay, that's an, that's one of the motivation why we consider these cases. And again, as I said, we will generate the the, uh, the noise-free solution data from the uh, the forward simulation of the original multi-scale equation. The second uh, scenario we consider so the a epsilon the multi-scale coefficient is unknown, so we can only get some okay we will only get some of the uh, uh, noisy data multi-scale noisy data measured from sensor. Okay, the, uh, the, the, those data, uh, we, for noise-free data, uh, we basically, as mentioned, I generated from the solving the multi-scale, uh, original multi-scale equation uh, with the finite element solver with a very fine mesh in order to account for all of the epsilon scale effect. And then for noisy data, we're just using this uh, uh, with synthetic data, adding uh, uh, standard, normal, uh, standard normal noise into this uh, noise-free data. We try to say how the noise affects our approximation. And in the following slides, uh, the A hat star, that's our uh, pin approximation. And the U0 uh, is the, our pin approximation to the homogenized solution. And this is the pin approximation to the homogenized coefficient. And uh, A star, and the U0H will be our reference solution for the homogenized coefficient or G, G limit or the homogenized solution, okay? With this notation, I want to start with a very simple, relatively simple example. This one is a, it's a local periodic cases. 
you can say this is the corresponding uh, uh, multi-scale coefficient and it's pure, local periodic. And in this, case, in this case, we know what is the analytical solution for the A star, the homogeneous coefficient. So we can compute the corresponding uh, homogeneous solution based on this A star as our reference solution. Now, to start with uh, the result, first result I want to say is the no, no, uh, noise frequencies with different epsilon. So I can sh I show you two cases. One is this is the epsilon uh, is ten uh, two to the minus three. This is a two to the minus seven. This is for the corresponding approximation for a uh, homogeneous coefficient. And the right line is the uh, is the true solution, the ground truth, and the the, the blue line is our pin approximation, okay? So one thing you can optimize uh, is that when epsilon goes to zero or, or very small, then this approximation for the, uh, the pin approximation for the homogenized coefficient or G limit is, re is quite accurate, okay? Quite accurate. Similar, similar things you can observe from the solution, uh, multi-scale solution, uh, sorry, homogenized coefficient, homogenized solution. So this is for epsilon is 10 to the minus three, and this is 10, uh, two, to the minus, two to the minus seven. And again, blue line is the, our ground, uh, blue line is our approximation, red line is our uh, uh, reference solution. One, one thing is interesting thing, for if epsilon is small, we know that if we expect it will work well because when epsilon is small and the noise free cases, the multi-scale solution is quite close to the true solution. The true, uh, it's a good approximation of the, uh, the homogeneous solution. So we, we do expect that it has good behavior. The interesting about here uh, is this, when epsilon is uh, relatively large, we don't expect it's so, uh, so uh, doing so good job, at least for the solution, homogeneous solution. But if you look at uh, the behavior, Okay, we have the right line again is the uh, is the the the, the reference uh, homogeneous solution, and uh, this blue line blue dot line is our approximation, and the dot is the data we're given. So you do see the 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 multi scale data here, the black dot. They you do see their uh, the multi scale oscillation or multi scale um, perturbation there, but. With pin, it seems that, at least numerically, it shows that pin trying to follow, uh, to capture the macro behavior of the data, which is the home, uh, homogenized solution in this case, the true, uh, the ground truth homogenization uh, solution here, here. Okay, so that's that's the message. Sure, I want. Sure, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, did you vary the weights? the weights in front of the loss functions? How did you do this? Because that uh, could have an effect. Uh, we used, uh, uh, I believe, uh, we used the, the, the NTK to uh, adaptively choose that. The adaptive weights, self-adaptive yeah, uh, weights? Yeah, adaptive weights using NTK, yeah. Uh, okay, not, not which ones, the dynamic weights or the self-adaptive weights? Different. Uh, that one I have to make sure I have to check that. I, I used one uh the uh Paris developed. Yeah, okay. No, no um, there is a, yeah, we use the version that uh was developed at Texas AM, uh -huh. where the weights are actually also hyperparameters, those those uh, loss weights are hyperparameters. Okay. So so those seem to follow the physics better. Okay. So so I I think you may try that because you would see different variations with the data. Uh -huh. these, these are trainable parameters. It's just one optimization. It's the steepest ascent, actually. Okay. This, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I will look, look for the, the reference and look at that. Yeah. Okay, thank can you for you, the comment. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question here? So I think yeah. I, can you, uh, can you go back to your previous slide on the equation? Yeah, here I see that you have a all fixed boundary condition so that your boundary condition is same for all even the homogenized solution as well. So mm -hmm. do you think it would be your performance might be affected by, by allowing your boundary condition to say like epsilon or decaying to epsilon, then, then your- If, it's a, might, if yeah. it's a 
if it's a relatively easy, epsilon, definitely it will be a challenging problem. But uh, in most of the, uh, at least the, the multi scale elliptic equation literature, we are familiarized that their boundary condition are, in general, is directed boundary condition is not depends on the epsilon. I see. Thank you. Yeah, it can be, but it can be. Then, then, then the problem will be harder. I would say. Yeah, right, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, those, those, all of the problem we talk, uh, we show here is the standard, uh, setup for the multi-scale elliptic equation community. Okay. Yeah. Again, I want to make a point of that. So even though the data has multi-scale variation. But uh, the pin solution, pin approximation, actually is trying to follow the Markov behavior of the data, not trying to follow the variation. Okay, in this case, and also to 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 comment the uh, George and uh, the question. So if you use, I don't know if you consider this data has a lot of data. If you're trying to do the uh, do the smart averaging, will that work? I never tried that. So the Maybe I, I can ask you more opinion on that. Okay. Yeah. And okay, then we fix the next result. I want to fix the is the is the epsilon, which is small, and but I will try to uh, try to understand the the noise behavior in this case. So in this case, we have the uh, so here we have the noise free uh, approximation. So it looks reasonable good, and once you add more noise uh, on the data, multi scale data. So you do expect that then the, per, the approximation be, uh, become a little bit worse, but not too worse. It can still capture the, the ma major behavior of the, the, the homogeneous coefficient or G limits. Okay. And for the solution, uh, corresponding homogeneous solution, you can say for noise free, in this case, is fits the uh, capture the homogeneous solution quite good. With the one percent noise is still okay, and for three percent, uh, even though you do see the, uh, you can see the uh, the noise, uh, is not small, but in general the pin solution, for pin approximation to the homogeneous solution still capture well about the, uh, the the ground truth homogeneous solution, okay. So pin, I feel that pin in this case does help to filter out a little bit, uh, filter out the noise in the multi-scale data and filter out the multi-scale variation. Now we want to show some the uh, some the error convergence with the the fine scale uh, parameter. So fine scale parameter will be oh, is uh, is uh, the convergence will be interesting to say. So here left hand side is the G limit or homogeneous coefficient the corresponding relative error to error with respect to the epsilon, if it makes epsilon to be small. And for uh, the right plot is the corresponding homogeneous uh, solution, uh, convert, uh, relative error to error convergence with respect to the epsilon. Now, clearly you can see when you have noise free, you do see the clear convergence for the G limits and uh, the homogeneous coefficient of G limits and the homogeneous solution. Okay, this is not a surprise because we, in this case, at least this right now is the local periodic cases. We know that when epsilon goes to zero, then multi scale solution is a good surrogate or good approximation of the homogeneous solution. So we do expect that a pin can do a good job on that. Okay. And for noise data, now you can see that when so for this is a 1% noise result, 3% uh, and 5%, 1%, 2%, 3% uh, and 5%. And you can see that when noise is not very large, so you can still see some uh, error decay or convergence. Uh, but once they reach to a certain uh, stage, your noise uh, level is, is dominant over the five skill uh, level, uh, effect then you do expect the error, uh, the error saturation in this case, which we observed when, especially when uh, we have a high level noise, you can say basically, um, even though we do expect the multi-scale solution uh, will converge to, uh, well converge to uh, very close to the, the, the homogeneous solution, which epsilon is small, but the noise destroy 
the uh, if you have very large noise, it will destroy this convergence. Okay, at least in this local periodic cases. Okay, now the next example, we try to push a little bit uh, harder, try to try a harder problem. So this problem is the following one. It's still elliptic equation, but with a highly oscillatory coefficient here, you can see that's the very massive formula here. The traditional homogenization work um, method will not work, at least the major one. There might be uh, some uh, specialized one, but major one won't work for this one. So the, in this case, we have the analytical solution for the analytical solution or formula for the homogenized coefficient. Okay, I want to give you a uh, intuition how it uh, how the two coefficient uh, behaves. So you can see the multi scale coefficient uh, oscillatory quite uh, uh, quite oscillatory, but the a star the homogenized coefficient is in general smooth. And if we push the epsilon to be smaller, you can see the oscillation is become uh, uh, faster. Okay. Again, challenging is that uh, there's uh, the traditional uh, homogenization uh, homogenization method uh, is not is not uh, easy to apply to this problem. Okay. Again, we start with noise-free data because we can easily to see the error behavior uh, or the performance of this method. Okay, now we start with the, for noise-free data with different uh, uh, fine scale parameter. And again, we observe the similar behavior when epsilon is small. And the blue line is the, our, again, blue line is our approximation. And the uh, red line is the uh, red line is the ground truth, uh, homogenous coefficient. You do say when epsilon goes to zero, becomes small. Then we get a better approximation for the uh, pin approximation to the home size coefficient, and similar thing we observe from the um, from the home size solution. And again, in this case, we didn't use uh, compared to the epsilon size, we didn't use quite a lot of data in this case. For the first example, that's the same. Uh, that's the same thing. We didn't use quite a lot of data in the in the in the chromatic scale data. Can I can I ask a question here? Yeah. So it seems that if you have a small epsilon but use less data, then the data will not represent your uh, multi-scale solution correctly because the, there's oscillation and the number of the points needed to capture the solution. The, would it be possible that mm. you get a somehow smoothing effect somehow obtained from like coarse Sampling? samples? Yes. Effect. Uh, so to address this question, so for this one, so for the first example, even though in epsilon is large, we do see the uh, you can see with the sampling, we do see the oscillation, right? But the pin still trying to follow the the Markov behavior, which is very close of uh, Markov behavior of the data. But still oh, capture the um, try to follow the the homogenized solution behavior. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And okay. Now, if we trying to for we fix the epsilon, which is two to the minus seven, and we try to add, try to consider the noise how the uh, how the noise level influence the approximation result. So again, this is a noise free cases, 1% noise, 3% noise. And you do say that when you have larger noise, of course, uh, you do see the pin approximation uh, in general we expect it's become worse. And for the, well, for the um, home genome solution, it seems that it's okay. Even though we have a very large noise, then the pin approximation it still looks reasonable good compared with the the, the ground truth uh, homogenized solution. Okay, that's that's this cases. And also, we'll show the error convergence with respect to the epsilon. In this case, uh, again, uh, left hand side is the uh, homogenized uh, uh, the convergence for the homogenized coefficient, and the right hand side is the uh, convergence for the homogeneous, homogeneous solution. So this one, the convergence much, I would say much stronger compared to the previous example. 
And you do see the clear convergence when epsilon goes to zero for uh, noise-free cases, which again, that's what we, we expected. When epsilon goes to zero, then multi-skill solution data is a good approximation, a good surrogate of the true solution. So using that, using that, you you you're able to capture the uh, the homogenized solution behavior and corresponding homogenized uh, limit. Okay, and when when noise is become larger, this one percent, three percent, five percent, and uh, you do say that uh, when you Noise is large enough; it can over it's dominated over the fine scale uh, parameter or effect. Then it will saturate quickly. For five percent, we do we do not see too much um, uh, the, the error convergence. However, if you look at the error here for G limit, I won't say it's quite bad. It's below. Uh, it's close to um, less than five percent. I would say less than five percent. And similar thing for the uh, the solution, homogeneous solution. We also see that uh, when we add a noise a little bit, then now you start to see that the noise, the error converters start to level up, level up or saturate. Due to the, the data uh, is contaminated by the, no, by the noise and we, we didn't see too much, it's hard to see the Markov behavior of the solution, behavior of the uh, homogeneous solution, okay? The next one we tried uh, is a uh, 2D non-periodic cases. Uh, in this case, it's uh, in the in the the, the sec x2 direction is non-periodic cases, and in this case, we compute in this for this example we take from one literature we can compute its uh, reference g limit from this method, the lambda steel convergence method using finite element method, and uh, since this one is non-periodic coefficient in general, the traditional homogeneous uh, approach, forward approach won't work. So we will see if that pin will help to, uh, to extract the, uh, the reasonable good uh, homogenous model. Uh, in this case, you can see I show you uh, for, let's say, I show you the result for different uh, noise level. And uh, uh, you can see uh, uh, th this is a similar to our uh, previous example. This is, this is a 2D problem. I only plotted the uh, one line, x1 equal to 1.5. And uh, in the whole domain, we'll use around uh, 16,000 uh, point in the 2D domain as the multi scale data. And as you notice that if you have no noise, then the result is in general looks reasonably good. With the noise, uh, contamination on the multi scale data. Now, now you can see the pin approximation for the G limit of homogenized coefficient become a little bit worse, but still with the reasonable, uh, it's still reasonable good approximation. Similar for the uh, for the homogenized solution, and it's but in the solutions itself, it seems to doing a did a little better job compared to the G limits or the homogenized coefficient here. And in this case, if we uh, plot the error convergence with respect to the fine scale parameter, again, uh, in this case, uh, noise free, you can say if there's no noise, then you'll continue to converge, okay? Continue to converge here. Again, verify our, uh, our assumption that when epsilon goes to zero, multi scale solution data is a good approximation or good surrogate for the homogenized solution. And now, if you have a more noise contaminate, then uh, it over, it's a, it's a, the noise level is over, dominant over the fine scale effect, then we will expect the, the error saturation, both for both um, hom homogenized coefficient and homogenized co uh, solution here. And the last example we try is that, okay, we want to say that even though uh, this one is, uh, uh, so in this one, we want to say if that, uh, how the, pro, how the uh, current approach can handle if you have a multiple skills, fine skills. So for example, right now, our coefficient is this one. You have basically two skills, more than two skills. 
it's very, it's very, we can consider this one is a epsilon one, this one is a epsilon two. You have two different separate scales. And in this, oh, in this case, uh, we have an analytic solution in this. We are lucky. We have this uh, analytic solution here. We want to compare the behavior uh, of the pin transformation with the true solution. Okay. Uh, now here I will first show you some of the uh, corresponding matrix scale solution looks like coefficient looks like. You can see you can clearly see that the, the two scale uh, oscillation and it, this is for a small uh, larger epsilon. If you push a little bit harder epsilon. Uh, when epsilon is small, then the, it's quite oscillatory for the multiscale coefficient. And then this is a corresponding multiscale solution. And you do see the, the multiscale oscillation uh, or perturbation here. And for uh, epsilon is small, then the oscillation is quite small. You have to uh, zoom in, to, in order to look at that. Okay, But it's a very high frequency oscillation. Now, if you look at uh, the, uh, the noise-free data with different epsilon, now you can see that uh, when, again, we say large epsilon, we don't expect that uh, we get a very good result on the transformation of the G limit and the solution, and especially for G limit. Uh, but when epsilon is small, we get a relatively good result uh, match for the, the uh, homogeneous coefficient or G limits, the ground truth one. And for, um, for the home genetic solution, uh, of course, when epsilon is small, we get a better result. But again, we have the similar behavior. So even though the data contains the multi-scale variation or multi-scale perturbation, this is noise free cases again, even though your data contains the multi-scale variation perturbation, then the pin approximation to the home genetic solution still trying to capture the ground, the macro behavior of the solution. Uh, the homogeneous uh, uh, Markov uh, behavior of the uh, multi-scale solution, which is close to the, the homogeneous solution. We want to choose the homogeneous solution, right? So you can see the dot is the, the multi-scale data, while the red line is the, the reference homogeneous solution, and the blue line is the, uh, our pin approximation, right? Our pin approximation. And then for this one, we're, we're just trying to, again, to explore, to examine the, the, the performance or result for different noise level. Uh, with uh, with uh, noise free, we get better result, the best result. 1%, the result start to become a little bad, but 3% seems a little bit worse than uh, our previous examples, three examples. But I feel this might be related with the training is not enough. We'll do a little bit more training uh, epochs and see what happens here. Or maybe try just uh, adaptive weights, it may, it may help. And for the homogeneous solution here, again, noise-free cases, you can see it's matched quite well with the, true, uh, with the, um, the ground truth homogeneous solution. With, uh, with, a lit, with more noise, it's still not doing a, a reasonable good job to match the homogenized solution here, okay. Okay, so again, uh, so we talk about the traditional homogenization in the multi-scale elliptic equation literature. So they usually require the explicit formula or periodicity uh, assumption for the multi-scale coefficient. But for if we want to develop the, for general setting, non-periodic setting or non-standard uh, non setting, so the traditional homogenization approach won't work so well, uh, even not applicable. Okay, there's no material method or framework to do that yet. There, for some special example, they might have, but in general, there's no, uh, no, no, no mature approach. So here, uh, we try using PIN to handle the, uh, the homogenization problem for non periodic cases and non-standard cases giving noisy-free multi-scale data, solution data, or noisy data. And we can see that because uh, our hypothesis is that when epsilon is small, the multi-scale solution will converge to the home data solution. So multi-scale solution data, at least at epsilon small, is a good surrogate to the home data solution. We can use them as the data for pin to train the, uh, to, to learn the G, G limit 
or homogeneous coefficient. And we also observe that the physical informed loss we provide through the homogeneous equation, it does help filtering out the noise or multi-scale oscillations. It can help us to capture the Markov behavior of data. So the, uh, of course, those example is still uh, relatively simple. Uh, but in the future, we want to test a more complicated example or setting. And also right now, we don't have a very rigorous uh, uh, insights, theoretical insights on this firm. Uh, that might be uh, require a little bit more time to develop the insights on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shui Yu. Uh, any questions? Uh, hi, Dr. Zhu, this is Jen from hi, the Jen. Crunch Group. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, can I ask a quick question? Like, sure. Could you go back to the like result section where you plot like the, the oh yeah, this one, yeah, uh, next one. Um, yeah, this, uh, it's uh, so where you plot basically the error versus the epsilon. Oh, um, okay. Uh, yes. This so, is the first example, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm curious about like for all these experiments, like for uh -huh. uh, for the different noise level, did you do like one experiment or like you 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 test like multiple experiments? So I just want to know like the robustness uh, of this. Um, I think we try diff uh, try multiple uh, one. We pick the best one. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. More questions. Go, go ahead, Matthias. Oh, thanks. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. yeah first, uh, thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. um, I just first wanted to comment on um, um, if you if you asked uh, other researchers from a different community, they would uh, classify this um, problem as a, a singular perturbation problem. Uh -huh. If you have x over epsilon as a second scale, then mm -hmm. this would be a singular perturbation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe this is uh, something you should also look for. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, secondly, um, I mean, here you are looking for what what is called a macro scale or reduced uh, reduced, model. reduced yeah. model solution or, or surrogate mm -hmm. model solution, a mm -hmm. surrogate solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it, it depends on the problem if if this is what you are seeking for. So mm -hmm. if you if you think about, for example, porous media, then mm -hmm. this is the right solution. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you uh, switch from an elliptic problem, for example, to a Schrodinger equation, <laughs> then, then the people also want to see these oscillations. So they, they uh. want to see the fine scale. Mm -hmm. And um, then often there are some approaches used that are splitting the macro and the, the micro scale. And mm -hmm. the, the, the simplest approach is this uh, WKB approximation. WKB, okay. Uh, so you would have somehow for, for each scale, you have a, a, a separate problem and a separate net you have to train. So, so maybe this is some interesting direction to, to, to follow. Yeah, yeah. We used to teach, we used to teach this, this in the classes. Now they, they we don't teach these classes anymore. That's why <laughs> they don't know this. Yeah. It used to be a standard material, WKV. Yeah, so yeah. In applied mathematics, I took it with Orzak at MIT. <laughs> he, he had a book on that, but uh, the, uh, our students today, the younger generation, does not know this method actually, uh, because there's all this. But, but I agree with Matthias. Singular perturbation and WKB is basically that was developed there to tackle different scales and separate and and see that uh, it could be it could be used also for training. Actually, this type of methods could be used for because uh, I was going to tell you about that. Uh, Show you is that mm -hmm. um, uh, expecting to have 160 for one D problem. Multi, so many multi-scale points. That's not so easy. So, so it's okay. like uh, you break the bank. But maybe, maybe you can think of this multi-fidelity framework, mm -hmm. where you, you are given some measurements, let's say that of the high fidelity, mm -hmm. and then you can have a lower fidelity, uh, which help. is cheaper. It's not perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're not gonna break the bank. And right. uh, and then, uh, like Matthias said, maybe some of this. Uh, models could uh, could give you approximate models, which you could also use them as a lower fidelity, if you like. That's true. In That's in, true. in in the in the uh, multi fidelity framework, but uh, to make it a little more realistic, because if you if you are working like uh, for a porous medium, I, I work with uh, Hanford site at PNNL, and and uh, there's like it's a seventy kilometer area. 
<laughs> and, the, and, and the most they can have is a thousand holes, right? And a thousand is a lot. Uh, yeah. So, so you're not going to get uh, much, but but not you know the, the thing is you don't need multi-scale data everywhere. You, yeah. you need so, some. So that's mainly for the second scenario for the if you, when you see I think you mainly refer to the sensor case right for the yes, yes. yes for yes. the first one the noise uh, the noise phrase uh, data is basically for the simulation data. So even though I'm the first one uh, is one of our major target because. Uh, I think that will be more realistic because you you have the a epsilon the multi coefficient, but you don't know how to go from there to a star. Yeah. In general, there's no framework. So then I feel that a pin we refer reformulate this one uh, using the uh, as the parameter estimation from using pin, will at least provide some approximation one one way one approach. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, if you follow the traditional way, go from given a epsilon. And to go A star, I don't know for general setting, there's one way to go there. At least right now, there's no no, no theoretical foundation for that. I mean, people no, don't know how to do that. Right? That's why just this, the first scenario, this one will help. I agree that if for a practical scenario, then uh, a lot of a sensor data from multi school front that might be not realistic. Yeah, that's why uh, that, that's one of the also one of the concern. So, wave, wave propagation also in randomized media, all the work that Papa Nicolau and others did, that, that would be a good area for you to yeah. tackle, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yongchun, you have a question? Uh, yes, just one quick question is, in scenario one, when epsilon and A epsilon is known, then you can get uh, as many data you wish, mm -hmm. then I'm, because your pin formulation is just the standard formulation, assuming uh, just a forward the problem approximating the solution of the PDE. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you have a lot of data and you use the large enough uh, network architecture, then I feel like you might encounter just to recover macroscopic solution. Macro scale solution? Uh, yeah, micro scale, you mean the multi-scale solution, right? Yeah, multi-multi-scale solution. Yeah, that's a theoretical interesting question uh, in the sense that, so I used the, uh, Well, basically the pin loss, I use this equation. And now in general, uh, if we, we consider we have multi-scale solution, if we can see the multi-scale, we have a lot of data. The question is that can we, can this, can this one can learn the multi-scale coefficient? So right now I feel you really need a lot of data, right? I mean, if you look at the, one of the solution, which is a non-standard, uh, let me see that. Maybe last one. Uh, so for example, the, the really interesting part is when epsilon goes to very small and this oscillation is quite a lot. You really need a, quite a lot of data to, to capture that. And also for uh, in general, using pin or network to capture high frequency uh, information is still is still not a mature uh, area. I feel given a high frequency uh, data, uh, can you approximate well using neural network or using pin? Even uh, can be a, a, an open question. Even yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do we have any more question from our speaker? All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhu, for your presentation today. And thank you. Yeah, okay, that's the end of this week's current seminar. Uh, I hope everyone has a good Friday and weekend. Uh, see you next week. See you. Bye. Thank you, George. <laughs>